um, just some introductory stuff first. Just uh, who I am. My name is Mike Marshall, and I'm uh, my background is originally just IT software development, and kind of backed my way into SEO about uh, this would be late '90s or so, and um, been there ever since. But I approach it from an IT engineer, programmer's kind of perspective. Um, I do consulting, I do training, and I write software for, uh, for SEO. Um, I've also taught a class on search engine technology at the U.S. Patent Office. So in, in, in the SEO community, I'm known as a geek's geek, um, which doesn't say a whole lot among developers. <laughs> Um, but there aren't a whole lot of developers in the SEO community. So as we go through the presentation, there will be uh, there'll probably be some points where you may want to ask some questions. Feel free to ask questions during it. I'm going to try to leave time at the end for some Q&A, um, but I wanted to let you know my background just so you know you can ask um, any question you want as general or as detailed as you like, and I'd probably be comfortable giving some kind of answer. Um, that you'll need. Um, I will be going through this presentation somewhat quickly, but I am planning on having a webinar, um, a free webinar later, where I'll actually walk slowly through the, the presentation. And there are some, some tips and stuff that I'll give throughout. I won't have time to show you exactly how to do everything, but during that webinar, I'm going to kind of walk through, here's exactly how you do this and what it looks like. Um, so, if you follow me on Twitter, um, you can keep track of when I'll announce. It's just Michael Marshall this is my Twitter handle. I guess it's pretty low there on the screen. But um, if you follow me on Twitter, I'll be making an announcement of where that webinar will be and how you can join and that kind of thing, just so you know. Um, just a show of hands, how many people actually do some SEO, either for themselves or for clients. Okay, good, good. Because uh, there's a lot of uh, basic stuff I'm going to go through extremely quickly. Um, so if you get lost somewhere, just let me know. This is uh, this is kind of a sampling of some clients that I, um, that I work with. Um, this is what we're going to cover. I want to spend a little bit of time on uh, what I would call the current state of SEO, and then go into what I call next generation SEO. There's a, a pretty critical need for changing um, how SEO is done, mostly because of some drastic changes in the search engines. So some of the things that have been almost a mainstay of SEO are things that are not effective anymore. That's not something that's entirely new. That kind of happens from time to time anyway, as search engines change their algorithms. But some of the recent changes are um, more in the, in, the, in the vein of like paradigm shifts, actually. So there are two angles that I'm going to be discussing this from. One is looking at how we should be thinking about SEO to begin with, um, and thinking of it in terms of the way a direct marketer thinks of reaching their audience. We need to think of the search engine as our first audience, or some people might say our proximate audience, that will take us to the human audience we really want. And we need to look at the search engine the same way a direct marketer looks at their audience. Uh, so we'll be looking at things from that paradigm. And then it'll get um, somewhat technical and looking at some pretty significant changes in the search engines really upping the ante. They've done a much better job than they have in the past of being able to figure out what's natural, um, what looks normal, what looks spammy, and how they measure relevance. And as a result, we need to understand how they do that. Uh, those who don't understand how that's done will just be left to trying a trick here and a trend there and a, a tip here and seeing what sticks. Um, so I'm going to help, I'm going to try to help you understand how the search engine does that so that you can understand what needs to be done in SEO to adapt to that. Um, so some of the most recent 
I guess, well-known changes would relate to things like the, uh, the Panda updates from Google. Um, and what I'm going to share actually would be beneficial with respect to that, also with respect to the personalization of search, which has actually changed SEO quite a bit as well. Um, and what I'll share with you will also be useful for things like optimizing a page for AdSense so you can get better ad matches and higher paying ad matches. It will also help with things like quality scores in PPC so that you don't have to have a high minimum bid. Um, so something like that will affect your bottom line immediately if you increase your quality score. Any questions so far? All right. So when I talk about the new approach, um, there are a couple of goals that I have. I hope it will help remove any fears that you have related to doing SEO. Um, it help you minimize trial and error, gain a sustainable competitive advantage, and get more of the right traffic faster. And I'll talk about some case studies toward the end so you can see how this approach actually use, is used and you can see kind of like some before and after. All right, so what is SEO? It's pretty basic. Anything that you're going to do in SEO pretty much falls into one of these categories or a combination of them. Um, the only thing I don't have on here is things like uh, conversion optimization. But um, internal linking structure, external links, relevance, crawlability, optimizing your code, content relevance, all of these are the elements that are kind of the mainstay of, um, of SEO. And of course, uh, the pivotal first step is always keyword research, so you know you're targeting the right key phrases to begin with. So why is it, why is it important? Well, it's because 85% um, of all traffic on the internet is referred by search engines. So if you want to get visitors to your site, search engines are the best way to do that. And also the audience that you get will be an audience that is um, already interested in what you have. So it's a great way of advertising that's not just broad, general, but contextual advertising. You're reaching those visitors while they're interested in what you have. Google, of course, is the 800-pound gorilla. They've got the largest market share. Um, Yahoo and Bing are really Yahbing now. Um, Yahoo, I think, uh, officially does not have a search engine anymore. They are using Bing entirely. Um, I'm not sure what changes are on the horizon for them, whether they'll do what they need to do to pick up more market share, but it will be interesting to see how that works out. Um, this is just a little chart on search behavior of people who type in one, two, three, or four words. Um, and in general, it's the case that if you're trying to make some... Uh, conversions on your page, that the searchers that have longer key phrases are more likely to follow your call to action. The shorter key phrases are what, you know, what are called vanity phrases. You, know, you get bragging rights if you can say, hey, I'm on the first page for the keyword shoe, right? But you're not going to get much in the way of conversions from that kind of traffic because they're just browsing around. Um, with the search engines in general, there's kind of like a 60-40 split between natural search results and paid search results as far as what gets the most click activity. So I often tell people who are already engaging in PPC but haven't explored SEO that whatever success you're getting with PPC, if you can get a position on the natural search on the same page, you can stand to, to see sometimes a, a double or a triple of the success that you've got in PPC. Often with clients, I'll ask them first, what are your best performing PPC terms? And that's what I start with with SEO, because then you know you're going to start getting them traffic for something that's already working for them as far as getting, uh, getting sales or signups. So it's important to keep in mind the difference between what we see and what a search engine sees. So on one side, we've got your normal view of a web page with all the graphics and the layout. That's what we normally see. In the middle, we've got just the content, strip of all graphics. And on the other side, you've got the HTML code. As far as relevance, the search engine is primarily concerned with what's in the middle, the content stripped of all the graphics. 
Um, but then they're also looking at the source code itself. Most designers don't tinker around with source code much anymore because there are so many great design tools. Um, but there are some things that you need to know about what's in the source code in order to optimize the page properly. And it's also important to remember that that's what the search engine sees, not this. Another thing that's important is to understand that the search engines divide the world up into URLs, not pages. So you can have a page like this, and perhaps there's an iframe in there or something like that where content is coming from. There's some JavaScript that's maybe using Ajax and pulling information from a database and putting it in there. And when we look at this, we see all the content, all the information in one unit. A search engine sees it in multiple units. So if you've got an iframe in there, let's say maybe like this box here would be an iframe. The search engine sees that as a separate entity, a separate URL is a separate creature. And so they'll rank that separately. Similarly, if you've got Ajax that's going to the database and pulling stuff in real time, that's invisible to the search engine. If you can't see it in the source code, the search engine doesn't see it. And that's why it's important to know what's in that source code, because that's what the search engine sees. So when you're going about doing key phrase research and optimizing meta tags, these are some of the things that are um, important. First, obviously, you do your research on your key phrases to make sure you've got the right target terms. And then you want to make improvements in these uh, particular areas here. These are just some um, a rough outline of what you want to do in each of these areas. So um, one thing I'll say with the description meta tag, it's important to understand that does not affect your ranking. It affects your click-through rate. So you want to use that space to actually make sure you persuade the person to click on your listing. Um, and you've got a lot of freedom there because it's not going to affect your ranking at all. With the keyword meta tag, it's no longer used by any of the major search engines to affect ranking at all. I still get people who insist that I optimize their keyword meta tags. And um, sometimes it's like pulling teeth to get them out of that mindset because it's been understood for so long to be like uh, the foundation of SEO. If you're not going to optimize my keyword meta tags, then I'm going to find someone else. And I'll tell them, okay, if you'd like to pay me for the time and get nothing for it, I'm happy to do it. But the only thing you do is tip off to your competition what keywords you're going after. That's the only thing that you do that's positive with the keyword meta tag. And here's a bunch of other things with on-page optimization that are usually the mainstay of SEO, dealing with title tags, meta tags, alt tags, header, URL structure, internal linking, anchor text, um, relevant keywords near your inbound link, um, your content, keyword density, proximity, site maps to make sure all your stuff gets indexed, and issues of usability. Then you've got off-page optimization, which is basically trying to get links and trying to get buzz in social media using any of these types of different sources, whether it's social networking, um, directories, uh, social bookmarking, article submission, press releases, blog creation and posting, forums and comments, things like that. Um, one thing to keep in mind, for example, with signature links on forums and comments, they don't really do a whole lot for you um, unless the page that that signature link is on already has a lot of links coming into it because the value that you get out of a link depends on the strength of the page that the link is on. And if that page has no strength on its own, then the link is almost worthless. It's not going to hurt you, but it's not going to give you a lot of benefit. Uh, with article submission, you have to be very careful with that now because of Panda. Uh, there are a lot of article directories that have been abused by lots of spammers, and so they have boatloads of low-quality content. And the thing with Panda is that they're not just penalizing the pages that are low-quality, they're penalizing the whole site for having low-quality pages. So some of those article directories have been hit pretty hard with Panda, and so any articles that you have in there are not going to be valued very much. you have a question? Um, if I have time. 
<laughs> um, so that's something to keep in mind with that. So there are lots of ranking factors. Um, in fact, Google says they have 200 different ranking signals. So we're going to spend the next time, the next little bit of time, going over all 200 signals so that you know them. Actually, we're not going to do that. I just want you to know that there are a lot of them. Um, and some of them you have almost no control over, like the age of your site, right? You don't have a time machine for SEO that can make your site older than it is. Um, but there are other things that you have a lot of influence on. So, for example, uh, links coming in, um, anchor text of inbound links, things like that. But it's a very complicated area. And the one thing that you should know, and we will talk about this a lot later, that not all of these factors have the same influence all the time. So for one particular key phrase, one of these may be more important than others. And for a different key phrase, that same factor may not be as important. What determines which factors are weighted in which way actually depends on the competitors for that particular key phrase. So one of the standard things that's done in SEO is thinking in terms of there's kind of a hard set rule for what you need for your title tag, what the keyword density needs to be, what the number of words and copy needs to be, what your um, links need to look like. And once you figure that out, that becomes your set of rules. And you can apply that indiscriminately across your entire site, across any pages, for any key phrase that you want to rank for. And following those rules will help you every single time. That's false. That's not the way the search engines work. They never have worked that way. Um, but what you need to do is figure out for your competitive landscape what needs to be done. And there will be some similarities and in many cases some overlap, but there isn't like this hard set rule for what you have to do in every single case. And that's why some people end up in a very kind of confused scenario where they follow someone's recommendations and it works in one situation and they say, oh, well, I'll just do the exact same thing over here and it doesn't give you the same results. It's not because the search engine is schizophrenic. So um, in looking at SEO, we need to look at SEO in a form, as a form of communication, actually. Um, much like language or music. Music is a form of communication, but we don't always think of it that way. And I'm thinking in terms of music that has no lyrics, right? You listen to a nice piece of classical music or even jazz, and you really get into it. And at the end, it's almost as though you heard a story. You feel like you've listened to a story at, at the end, and that's a form of communication because it affects you emotionally. SEO is actually a form of communication, even though it doesn't look like it at first. And you're communicating to the search engine when you're doing this. There's syntax and semantics, just like in normal language. The syntax is going to be the HTML code and making sure everything's in the right place and configured correctly. The semantics is going to be the content and how the search engine determines whether it's relevant. There's also structure and meaning, just like uh, normal language. So you've got the structure, once again, is inside of the HTML code, or also looking at um, what the search engines would call a web graph by looking at how does your page or your website fit in the web overall by looking at who you link to and who links to you. So there's all that structure there. And with that, they actually apply meaning, specifically, are you an authority site? Let's look at who you link to. Let's look who, who links to you and how many people are doing it and how strong their sites are. That's gleaning meaning out of that structure in the internet. There's also structure on your site within your own website with how your pages link to each other. And they glean meaning from that, too. That's what link reputation is all about. You link to a page, and then anchor text tells the search engine, what is the person who links to that page saying that page is about? Um, and most people in SEO space know that regardless of what you put on your content, often what's in the links pointing to a page can trump what's on that content all day long. Um, I'll give you an example. There is a, there's a, a branch, well, I guess it's kind of like a, a sub-branch within SEO known as negative SEO. 
Um, there's black hat negative SEO and there's white hat negative SEO. Negative SEO is basically um, using the, the strategies and tactics of SEO to cause one page to rank lower than it normally does. Um, and there are some dastardly things that you can do to adversely affect someone's ranking if you know how to do it properly. One of the things that you could do is give certain kinds of links. Um, so there's this well-known uh, case study in uh, the whole, uh, under the whole rubric of what's called language bowling. So you have a website, it's written in English, and it even has a meta tag that says this is an English website. There's no foreign language on the website at all, anywhere. And it has lots of links pointing to it from French sites, from sites in France, from pages that are written in French, and all the link text is in French. It starts to pile up more and more. At one point, you go and do a search and the page comes up, still in English, everything, but Google offers a little help there that says, would you like this page translated into English? But it is in English, because Google is starting to think this page is actually a French page, so it's gonna offer to translate it. So you, the links start piling up more and more, so eventually what happens is that page starts to decrease in this ranking in Google.com. It starts to rank higher in Google.France, Google.fr. And it gets to the point where you can't even find the page anymore in Google.com. It only shows up in Google.fr. And that's because of that structure and meaning that Google is gleaning from the links. And the links will trump whatever's on the content. So that gives you an idea of just how important that is. So when we communicate, there are many different styles of communication, right? They usually fall into three areas, messenger focus, message focus, and marketer audience focus. So messenger focus is like someone's talking to you and they don't really care about you or what you think. They only care about themselves and it shows up in their communication style. Message focus is someone is obsessed over the message itself. Once again, they don't really care about you they may not even care about themselves that much. They're just focused on the message itself. Normally what happens when you do that is you may not communicate effectively because effective communicators know based on the audience you're speaking to, you may need to tailor what you're saying so they can understand it better, especially if you're trying to get some kind of response out of them. You need to understand what their motivations are, what their fears are, what their hopes are so that you can communicate the same message in a way that really speaks to them. That's what audience focused is or, or market focus. So someone in direct marketing knows that. I mean, that's the mainstay of what they do is try to figure out the audience so they can craft copy in a way that speaks directly to who they need to uh, respond to their call to action. And the same way, we need to look at search engines that way as our audience and understand what are they looking for in the structure and meaning so we can give them what they need in the way they need it. And many of the principles of effective copywriting and direct marketing have parallels with effective SEO. So one of the first principles in copywriting is put yourself in the position of your audience and the mindset of your audience. <coughs> and that's essential for keeping a customer focused style of communication. In SEO, you've got to understand fundamentally what a search engine is and how it thinks. A search engine, insofar as it's an information retrieval system, has three goals. Recall, precision, and ranking. Recall is give me everything I'm looking for. Precision is give me only what I'm looking for. And ranking is give it to me in a meaningful order. And if you understand that those are the goals of a search engine and that it always has to do that, then it puts you on good footing to understand what directions a search engine may go in and changing their technology, what things would actually be you know, shooting themselves in the foot if they did that. So for example, um, there used to be a great debate over something called the sandbox in SEO and whether or not there was such a thing where there was kind of like this penalty for brand new sites. So a brand new site comes out and the normal thinking was, okay, well, it's brand new. Don't expect to be found in Google for at least a couple of months, maybe three, because they kind of put you in the basement when you're new and don't give you any, any prime time exposure. Now, if you understand that recall 
as one of the primary directors of a search engine, you would think that was ludicrous, right? Because if a person is searching and recall says, give me everything I asked for, a search engine is going to be information hungry, right? Always wanting as much information as, as they can get, as fast as they can get it, as fast as they can index it. Because those who display the new pages will get more traffic. So if you do a search and you're finding out that, well, in this particular search engine, everything I find is always at least two months old. I can't find anything that's recent, right? That would just be idiotic from a commercial standpoint. So why would a commercial search engine have as part of its algorithm, we're going to temporarily penalize all new pages and they won't show up with any decent rankings for at least two months. But there was still, there was lots of debate within the SEO community. There is a sandbox. You can't get a brand new page ranked in Google with, without waiting for two or three months. And it never was true. And Matt Cutts always used to say, no, there's no sandbox. And everyone accused him of lying. But there was no sandbox. And now they've even upped the ante of that where they're putting additional effort on trying to get fresh content as quickly as possible. Most of that is because of the emergence of social media and how important that's become. And they're using a lot of that to actually find the new stuff. So that's an example of how not understanding how a search engine works and what its real goals are can cause you to actually end up believing myths that aren't helpful. Would you? Some of them do. Some of them actually um, will go to Google and other search engines and pull results there. But the ones that have their... What is Bing, what is Bing doing? Is it... <laughs> uh, well, is it... Bing was recently caught red-handed swiping results from Google. Okay. Um, but uh, they have their own index and algorithm too. And so most of their results are from their index. But they were actually... Actually, Google set up a sting. Google suspected that that was going on, and they created, um, for some very obscure, obscure search terms, um, they put in some results in their index that were ranked for that that, would, that had no business being there. And when they did the same search on Bing, the <laughs> same results showed up in the same exact order for those searches. And uh, so, yeah, sometimes they take it from Google, sometimes other places. When they do have their own index, the smaller search engines are usually um, easier to get rankings in because the competition isn't as stiff. On the other hand, there's less traffic there. And depending how, on how niche of a search engine it is or how popular or unpopular it is, um, your target audience may not even be represented there. So that's the downside of that. Um, <clears throat> so in the realm of paid search, um, this is a, a quote from a friend of mine. It says, Google default, Google's defaults are always set on what's good for Google. So it, in organic search, you need to know what's good for Google. What helps with other focused communication and copywriting and direct marketing and with relationships also helps in SEO, which leads to the next principle. There are things your audience won't or can't tell you but are essential for you to know. And 80% of copywriting is research. Similarly with SEO, um, there are things that search engine can't tell you, but are essential for you to know. And so you have to do research to figure it out. Um, and this is what I call SEO forensics or competitive intelligence. By analyzing your competitive landscapes, you learn these things that are important for you to know that the search engine isn't going to just come straight out and tell you. And we'll, we'll talk about that uh, later. So here's a, kind of like a comparison of different aspects of copywriting and a corresponding component in SEO. So if you understand things like establishing credibility, benefits, accessibility, community, relevance, congruency, current events, things like that, and how important that is in copywriting, the search engine is looking for those same exact things, right? They're trying to deliver to the searcher what they think the searcher wants in the same way that a copywriter is trying to deliver to a reader what they think the reader wants. 
but the search engine can't read like a human does. The search engine looks at these elements to try to approximate what they think these are that the human reader is going to want. So they're looking at link building, quality content, um, search engine friendly sites, um, social media, themes and natural language processing, language page relevance, traffic demand, news, things like that, um, to try to approximate what they think will please the human reader. And so you need to know these are the areas to focus on so you can make sure that Google puts you in front of who you're looking for. And so this is really a partnership. A lot of people in SEO look at it as uh, a war between optimizers or optimization and the search engines, that you have to try to figure out how to beat the algorithm or gain the system. But the proper way of looking at it is a partnership. The search engine is trying to deliver to the reader the same thing that you're trying to deliver to the reader. But you need to understand how does the search engine read this stuff and figure out what I'm trying to say and focus on those. So the key to this is math. And a lot of people don't like math, um, especially in the SEO community. <laughs> um, they're, not, uh, they're not mathematicians there. Um, but we're going to look at it because we have to. Um, and I promise it won't hurt, at least not that much. So, anyone recognize this? Anyone want to take a gander as to what it is or where it comes from? Or Albert Einstein is correct. You see, whenever I do this, when I'm speaking in SEO conferences, nobody gets this. <laughs> so. This is right, this is from Einstein. And we're gonna learn something from Einstein um, as we get started on this portion of the, uh, the presentation. How did Einstein make his leap toward the general theory of rel relativity with respect to the types of math that he used? So here's a list of a whole bunch of different types of math, everything from algebra down to vector calculus. And I just wanna get some guesses from you, unless you already know. Um, what were the key elements or types of math that he used? Any guesses? No. Algebra. Algebra. Anyone else? Differential equations. Differential equations. Usually people say all of them. <laughs> all right. This is the answer, algebra and geometry. Now, obviously the general theory of relativity is a lot more complicated in meaning than just algebra and geometry. But he was able to do that because he took something that was very complicated and put it in a form where he could analyze it with much simpler means. He created a mathematical model. And that's what needs to be done in SEO in order to learn from the search engines, what's important that the search engines can't tell you, a mathematical model. And in general, it's used to describe real world phenomenon so you can investigate important questions, explain some things, and make some predictions. And the process is fairly straightforward. You start with real world data, create a model, do some analysis, interpret it, and then test it. And the purpose is not to try to explain everything about this real world phenomenon, but it, the most important things that you need to explain in the simplest way. And the benefit is that you get understanding. That's how data um, can give you understanding, is by a model. And in some cases, the very form of the model itself will lead directly to understanding before you even start analyzing. You put something in a different form and all of a sudden, wow, I didn't notice that, something you didn't see before. But first, you have to have a model. This is an article from Business Week that I encourage you to read at some point. Um, it talks about how a generation ago, uh, quantitative analysts or quants uh, kind of turned the world of finance upside down. But since then, 
that's been applied to almost every discipline you can imagine. And huge leaps have been made um, by doing so. This article talks about a lot of those different disciplines and how it works, and that now is a magnificent time to know math. That is, I think it's 2006. Yeah. If you, ask, if you actually do a search on Business Week and math will rock your world, it'll come up. So, laying the foundation of this mathematical model. So here's a question. What influences your SEO success more than anything else? One particular thing. Content? Anyone else? Other suggestions? Hmm? Ah, content freshness, okay. Links, okay. Competition. Competition. Anyone else? The power law, also known as the 80-20 rule or the Pareto principle, actually influences your SEO success more than any other thing. I'm going to go into exactly why. In general, the power law says that diversity plus freedom of choice creates inequality. And the greater the diversity, the more extreme the inequality. So we're doing a lot of abstract stuff here, but at the end, or toward the end, I'm going to show you how this makes you money, okay? <laughs> how it impacts your business. But you have to understand this. So, um, in systems where many people are free to choose between many options, a small subset of the whole will get a disproportionate amount of traffic or attention or income, whatever it is that you're measuring. That's what the power law basically says. And it doesn't have anything to do with like uh, moral weakness or selling out or some kind of psychological explanation. Just the very act of choosing, spread widely enough and freely enough, creates a power law dis distribution. Uh, so it shows up in the uh, the economist Pareto talked about a predictable imbalance in the distribution of wealth. Um, George Zipf uh, was known for showing how word frequency in any language follows a power law distribution as far as the, the percentage of uh, how much particular words are used. So there are a huge number of low frequency words um, and there are a small number of really high frequency words. And this is, of course, not anything that anyone has tried to make happen. This is just the way it is. Jacob Nielsen noticed that there was a power law distribution in website page views. Um, there are many man-made and naturally occurring phenomena, including city sizes, incomes, word frequencies, and so on, that are distri distributed according to a power law distribution. Um, We'll look at, this is normally what power law looks like. Normally you see it in this format. So there's the, uh, the head and there's the long tail, right? See that in marketing all the time. And this is, a, this is the same thing plotted just with a log, log plot so it looks almost like a straight line. Um, so I'm gonna look at some examples here. It actually shows up in consumer behavior, product market share, niche markets, things like that. And here's some examples of it's seemingly everywhere. Word frequencies in Moby Dick, citations of scientific papers, web hits in AOL, a number of books sold, telephone calls received um, with AT&T customers on one day, the magnitude of earthquakes from 1910 to 1992, the crater diameters um, in kilometers on the moon, the peak intensity of solar flares, the intensity of wars, the net worth in US dollars, name frequencies, population of cities, all over the place. And this is what the simplest equation looks like for power law. Now, it also shows up all over the place on the web. The number of visits to a site, the number of pages within a site, the number of inbound links to a page, to name a few, all follow the power law. This is actually how the search engine can determine what's normal, what's natural, because they know there's this power law distribution. So they know, is this page getting too much attention? Is it abnormal? 
is this spam. They can tell because they know what's natural because all these things follow a power law of distribution. So in any website with more than a couple of dozen pages, pick any time period where the traffic amounted to at least 1,000 page views, and you will find that both the page views themselves and the traffic from the referring sites will follow power laws. So, right, so if you have a website with any sizable amount of traffic and number of pages, um, the page views, as far as which pages get the most views, which pages get the least views, will follow a power law distribution if you plot them. Similarly, the traffic that you get from referring sites, which pages have lots of referring traffic and which ones have a little bit, will also follow a power law distribution and the search engines look for these things. It also shows up in search behavior, which impacts personalization. Because as people are typing in search terms and the search engine is keeping track of that for history to create a profile to then shuffle the results according to their preferences, they're looking at all the different terms and how they relate and how they're used, and all of this follows a power law distribution. Um, the, number of, the number of visits to your site, the quantity and distribution of your inbound links and outbound links follows the power law distribution. Uh, your page views, traffic from referring sites, page rank, Google's page rank algorithm could not work if links did not follow a power law distribution. It's essential for it to work for that to happen. Well, yeah. So did the, did the algorithms look at that and what would look at just uh, everything being even? Mm -hmm. Or the things that are normally at the head are found at the tail. So for example, normally the web page on your site that gets the most links is your home page. That's normally right up there at the head. Then there are a couple of other pages below that and lots of stuff going on on the tail. So let's say you've got a page that you've optimized for a long tail key phrase and you start hammering it with links, right? Just pounding it, pounding it because you want that traffic, you want that ranking and it gets to the point where it's a huge proportion of your overall link profile, getting to the point where it either matches or even dwarfs your home page, that is not natural. And a search engine will see that and know it's not natural and penalize you for it. So that's just one area where this is how they use this, this is how it makes a difference. They know what's normal. And when there are exceptions to the rule, they know what those exceptions have to look like. So for example, let's say um, normally you get lots of attention to your home page. However, some big news or media event occurs, you get all kinds of attention in the media, a whole bunch of bloggers hear about it and they start blogging about you and they link to a specific page. And so now that particular page kind of stands out to be abnormal, but they know there's a reason for it. Why? Because they can track the links back to bloggers and an event. So if something's out of the norm, they need to see an explanation for why it is. If there isn't a natural explanation in algorithmic terms for why this is happening, then they figure it's artificial. Just like link text, when you're linking to a website or pages, most of the time people link to a website using the company name or the website name or something like that. That's what's normal. Every once in a while, they use some very specific um, link text. But what is not normal is for everybody to link to you with the exact same link text. It's kind of like if you were to go out and walk around, you went to a mall, and you were looking to buy a shoe, you never used that brand before, and you decide, well, I'm going to ask some people just randomly to see if they've ever bought this shoe and what they think of it. So you walk down the mall, and you, you ask someone who's wearing these shoes, hey, I see you got those new uh, Nike shoes. What do you think about them? And they give you an answer, maybe a 15-word answer. And it's like, okay, thanks. You walk down, you ask somebody else, they give you the same exact answer, the same 15 words, the same order. You're like, hmm, that's interesting. <coughs> right? So you say, well, maybe I'll go downstairs. So you go to the, the first level, and you ask somebody else. So three more times you do this, 
and everybody's giving you the same exact answer. At that point, you're like, okay, I get it. <laughs> this is fixed, this is set, you know, whatever. The search engine thinks the same way about link text because that's not normal, unless it's your company name or your website name or your personal name. So if they see you getting all kinds of links and all of them are using the exact same link text, sorry about that, the exact same link text, um, they'll think that's artificial, doesn't look natural. Right. And those kinds of things. So um, I guess we're kind of relating to that. Yeah. Yeah, when you normally you look at analytics, you can you can, you know, sort by whatever number you're looking at, page views, visits, new visits, things like that. And you see as the numbers decrease, it really does look like it's a, it's a power law distribution. This is just what a what a, a graph looks like um, plotting the distribution um, one of outbound links on the right side inbound links. So it shows up on search query behavior, we talked about that. Now outside of the technical stuff, it actually shows up the power law in consumer behavior, niche markets, and things like that. So how people behave on the internet also follows the power law distribution in many ways. So what does all of this mean? It means that there's structure in all that data. And if there's structure that's quantifiable, then you can get insight from that structure to yield actionable intelligence. In other words, you've got all this data out there about what's happening on your site and other people's sites and links and search behavior and queries. There's structure there so you can create a model and you don't have to guess anymore about what's important. There's a lot of time that's spent guessing in SEO. A lot of money that's wasted, a lot of time that's wasted guessing. Some people will spend five, six, seven months just trying to guess getting something right. What do I need to do to get this page to start rising in the rankings? And they spend five or six months testing and tweaking and testing and tweaking and testing and tweaking until they figure out, oh, these are the things that are important, and they start to <coughs> lift. If you get this data, make a model, and throw some math at it, then you can know out of the gate what you need to focus on. And spend that seven or eight months Rising in, the tra rising in the rankings as opposed to just guessing at what you need to do. Um, let's see. So here's what you can do when you learn from the structure. You can minimize trial and error. You can focus on the most important SEO factors. You can know when you're vulnerable to your competitors and how to respond if someone else is about to overtake you in the rankings. You can learn from what the top competitors are doing right because the top competitors are not necessarily doing everything right. There are some things, if you emulate them in isolation, will hurt you. Um, classic example, you have someone that's ranking number one, and you say, oh, well, let's see what they're doing so I can figure it out and rise up in the rankings too. So one of the things you look at is the keyword density in their copy. And you look at it, you measure it, and you say, oh, keyword density looks like it's about 8%, 9%. That seems a little high, though. But hey, they're ranking number one, so I'm going to do it. So you change your copy, so it's 8 or 9% keyword density, and you see yourself drop in the ranking. And you're like, that doesn't make any sense. I did what that guy did. But it may be the case that 8 or 9% keyword density is actually not good. But the reason why they're number one is because the most important thing for that key phrase is links. And their high quality links compensates for their high keyword density. And so if you go just emulating things, well, I'll mimic the title tag, and I'll mimic the copy, and then I'll mimic this, right? Without knowing what is really important here, you can hurt yourself. So you can learn which are the things that the top competitors are doing that I really need to pay attention to. And you can exploit what the top competitors are doing wrong. So if 8 to 9% for a keyword density is actually not a good thing, that's a weakness that they have. And if your keyword density is better, that gives you something where if you emulate the other things that are good, gives you an opportunity to knock them out of their spot. 
and you can diagnose a drop in ranking. So you're doing well, all of a sudden, boom, you're on the second or third page and you don't know why. You can, from the structure you get in the data, you can analyze it and figure out, oh, here's why I dropped and here's what I need to do to fix it. So traditional SEO is a lot of trial and error, tweaking this, tweaking that, testing. Um, and that aspect of SEO can be reduced quite significantly if you understand three things. One, that ranking in the search engines is relative. It's not an absolute scale, it's relative. So which factors are more important depends on what that landscape looks like. Much like being in a, being in a class where the grade is graded on a curve, right? All the other people in your class will have an impact on what you need to do to do well in that class and get a good grade. So you need to understand competitive landscapes, and that is who is being returned for your key phrase. Those are the competitors that influence what you need to do. And then understand that SEO factors are interrelated, that um, it's not just graded on a curve with a group of competitors, it's graded on a curve across the SEO factors. So, um, I want to give you a case study here and then show you how this is done. This is um, a pie chart that I made in Excel, 3D pie chart, that looks at a competitive landscape. This um, company is uh, Doxus Foster and Smith. Uh, they were ranking for the key phrase pet supplies. They were on the first page for quite a while, and then they dropped to the second page. They dropped from number six to number 12. Soon after that, they became a client of mine, and, their, and uh, this had happened, and they were sitting at number 12 for seven months. They weren't just sitting there not doing anything. They were actually trying to improve it. So they were making changes and kept lots of good records, but they couldn't move the needle. And my first assignment they gave to me was, okay, this is one of our top key phrases. You need to figure out what happened and fix it. I said, sure, no problem. So I took a look at it, um, analyzed it, and I gave them a prescription of what they needed to do. This little chart here is showing um, how close other competitors are to them in strength. So number 12, I don't know if you can see it, it's kind of down pretty low. It's highlighted in blue, that's where they were sitting. And these are the other competitors ranked from one to 30 that I looked at. The large pie wedges indicate that that particular competitor, it has a, has a great distance in competitor strength. And the small pie wedges show that they're close in competitive strength. The ones that are highlighted in red are actually the ones that are um, closest and competitive strength. So number six is where they were before. Seven months later, they're actually still pretty close because that pie wedge for number six is really small. But you wouldn't have known that if you were trying feverishly for seven months to try to get back to number six. You wouldn't know that you were this close to getting back. But I was able to show them that they were. And um, what happened was I figured out that there were three things that they needed to work on and nothing else. The entire seven months that they were trying to make a change, they never did anything with those three areas. So I said, work on this and nothing else. They did that for a month, and at the end of that month, they were at number four. Whereas before, seven to eight months, they weren't able to get anywhere. And it wasn't because they were slouches. They were, they were doing everything by the book, as far as traditional SEO is concerned, everything by the book. But it takes a long time to figure out what the right thing is to focus on. Because you can't change too much too fast when you're doing trial and error and testing, right? And you don't know always how long you have to wait before you know if the change that I made actually makes a difference. How long do I wait to tell whether it's been indexed and it's been re-ranked? And because you could make a change, wait one week, two weeks, ah, nothing happened. Change it back, and a week later, Google refreshes the index and re-ranks things. And what you thought was a result from your test is not a result at all because you didn't wait long enough. So they were very careful, very meticulous, and that's why it takes so long doing it that way. Whereas 
if you've got the structure of the data and you glean the intelligence, you can get what you need to know. And this is what I call search engine whispering, right? If you understand the search engine really well, know what its needs are, and you can analyze the structure in that data, the same structure that the search engine is paying attention to, you know exactly what to say to the search engine because you know exactly what they're looking for in each case. So you find that structure and you exploit it. Um, this we've gone over. These are just some case studies of uh, some folks. This guy, um, his site was actually sabotaged by a disgruntled, a, a disgruntled employee. And he suffered in the rankings for two years. He went through four different SEO companies to try to get them to figure out what this guy did to my site, undo it or you know, do something to, to drown it out or something so I can get back on the first page. And he was at the point where he was about to throw in the towel. He was about to close up shop because he, he just couldn't take it anymore. And I did the same thing for him that I did for Dr. Foster and Smith um, and got him back on the first page. In touch with me. Um, and like I said, I'm going to have a webinar. I'm going to go through step by step. It's a free webinar. I'll announce it through Twitter, and we'll go step by step on how to do this. So I collected the data from the competitors, at least the top 30, their title tags, their copy, their links, all the information that you normally take. I put it in Excel in a, a spreadsheet with uh, each of the rows were the competitors, each of the columns were the different SEO factors. And then I take a, cool, a tool that's called statistical. Um, it's spelled with an XL at the end. And um, that tool is an Excel add-in that does all kinds of different statistical analysis on any data that you put in. It's really, really fast. It, uh, it costs like uh, $79 for a lifetime license. So I've got all my SEO data in this spreadsheet. I take statistical, you highlight the table, and then you select what type of st statistical analysis you want. Um, and the tool has an extensive help system. It tells you everything. If you're measuring this, here's what you need to use, this statistical measurement. Once you get the output, here's what it looks like, and here's how you interpret it. So I take that, I highlight the table, I click a button, I get my results in two seconds. And I look at the table, and it tells me which SEO factors are most important and in what order, based on what I put in that table. And then I take that, and I look at the competitors, and I can tell, okay, here are the most important SEO factors. Let's look at what these competitors are doing. And from that, I can actually figure out what the, um, what the best range is from those different, um, those different SEO factors. From that, I can tell exactly where the competitor that I'm looking at, or my client, where they're weak. So I can say, okay, here's where you are. According to the output, this SEO factor is really important, but your score is really low. You're fine in all these other areas, but these three areas, your score is really low. And so here's how I'm going to fix you by telling you increase your scores on these three areas, and that's what they did. In each of these cases, that's exactly what I did. Um, so it takes all that data, all the structure in it, analyzes it, and then tells you what you need to do instead of guessing. And that's what people need to do in a new era of SEO because the time for guessing is over. The reason why is because you used to be able to throw everything out and see what sticks, see what works. But now the things that don't help you will hurt you. The things that used to be okay to just let sit out there, they are now penalizing you for. So you can't play the trial and error game anymore. You gotta know what you're doing and understand what you need to do. Yep. Not necessarily, but it won't hurt. <laughs> yes? I might be too hard to answer fast, but how do you, when you're looking for keyword density in someone's content, how do you, how do you figure that out? Like aside from reading it and find, like, is it just a manual? Just a manual kind of process. You count the words and you count how many times it appears. But I'll, I'll give you a, I'll give you a, this is a free giveaway, and that is the keyword density does not matter. Really? Yeah. What matters more is something called keyword proximity. But keyword density does not matter. Yes? I'm just curious, how far do you hold this page load time? It's becoming more and more important. Um, three seconds is kind of the optimal number that they look for. Really hard to get to that point, and they understand that. But that's like the sweet spot. If you can get to three seconds, 
and you're under that, they'll be happy. But it's become really important. And with that, I need to go. <laughs>